start preparing a little earlier than 65 or if you know it's, it's an insurance and you want to be prepared for it when it happens unfortunately most of our phone calls are like oh my god grandma's in the rehab she's getting discharged she needs home care we need medicaid please 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 so my advice is to get started a little earlier than, than when it's an emergency hey y'all this is costa and today i'm here with my guest bobby mendelovitz CEO and founder of Elder Healthcare Services, where his primary mission is to make the complicated Medicaid approval process easier and help you get Medicaid as quickly and efficiently as possible. Today, we're talking about Medicaid and long-term care, where to start. Bobby, thank you so much for joining us today. As of May 2022, nearly 89 million Americans are utilizing Medicaid. And I hope this conversation can help inform and demystify some of the aspects of this program that make it so intimidating for those enrolling and seeking assistance. So to start off, what is Medicaid? Medicaid is a state by state uh, program, which is essentially the best health insurance, especially in the state of New York. Um, It's a government supplemented program where they have two financial criterias that you have to fit into. At least I'm speaking for the state of New York. Um, And it covers everything in regards to long-term care. And it covers the 20% that Medicare doesn't cover for short-term care. Who, how, and when can you utilize Medicaid? So Medicaid that we're talking about for the elderly and disabled, you have to be 65 or older or disabled, meaning that uh, Mm -hmm. you have to be collecting Social Security DI, uh, or you can fill out a disability questionnaire. And we have other forms that can prove your disability if you didn't get it from your, if you're not approved with Social Security yet. Um, So 65 or older or disabled. Mm -hmm. When, as soon as you turn 65, I I can't stress enough that the family members are going to help their parents or whoever it is that can have this conversation to start preparing a little earlier than 65 or if you know it's, it's an insurance and you want to be prepared for it when it happens unfortunately most of our phone calls are like oh my god grandma's in the rehab she's getting discharged she needs home care we need medicaid please 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 please, please. right so my advice is to get started a little earlier than, than when it's an emergency so generally what services are covered by Medicaid and how does this differ from Medicare? So if the average, the, let's say somebody's getting discharged from a rehab or they're just older, they have dementia, right. whatever the illness or disease is, uh, and they need home care at home, that's the number one use for long-term care community Medicaid in the state of New York. Um, okay. It covers home care, which no other insurance company covers. It mm-hmm. covers durable medical equipment, and it covers your 20% co-pays at the doctors, at the at the pharmacies, and things like that, which makes it you know the best health insurance out there. Sure. And so, how is it different, or like you know the common misconception that hey, I have Medicare and I'm going to be fine? How do those two programs differ? So Medicare is strictly for short term, meaning you okay. cannot get long term care, home care with Medicare. Medicare okay. will give you something called CHA services, which is short term, which is about two or three weeks, two or three hours a day for the two or three weeks. Uh, but if you need long term care, which means like mom or dad need help for a longer period of time and they're going to be home sure. in the community, they need to have Medicaid. Medicare you get automatically when you turn 65 if you paid enough credits into the system. And it's also right. essentially the great, it's great, great health insurance because everybody in New York State has to take that because the government gives that out for free. Uh, the Medicaid is something that doesn't come automatically, and it differs than, let's say, like Obamacare or the regular Medicaid for under 65, where mm-hmm. under 65, they'll basically cover your hospital visit, short-term emergency room visit, or uh, you know your regular doctor's visit. But mm-hmm. long-term you know, community Medicaid, they, are, they have a much more difficult application process because it covers all those amazing things like home care, durable medical equipment, and the 20% co-pays and everything. Right. I mean, if you're somebody that needs long-term care and you don't have Medicaid, in your experience, what do people typically do? So if they don't have Medicaid, then they're paying out of pocket for home care and it just leaves them broke. And, yeah. and really, they should call somebody like myself because there's no reason for that. In the state of New York and other states that are have managed care, 
they usually have these two criteria, and most mm-hmm. states, certainly New York does, they have a remedy for each criteria if you don't fit into it. So to okay. just say, oh, I don't qualify because you heard that there's a limit, uh, that's not that's not true. It's a myth, and it needs to be debunked because it's it's absolutely false. Everybody in the state of New York right now qualifies for Medicaid if you follow the directions and the guidelines. Interesting. So the myth of having like too much income uh, or not being sick enough, you know, those types of things. Why do those myths exist? So the first myth comes from. The five-year look back, and every, and the lawyers, unfortunately, they don't even you know pay attention to what you're really saying. They just say Medicaid, okay, there's a five-year look back, and it's just going to be a problem. And if you have some mm-hmm. money, then it's just more work for them to help you out. But when you call a friend or a neighbor and they give you some half information, and then you call a lawyer and they give you some other information, it gets confusing, it gets overwhelming, mm-hmm. and really, it, it's it's really doing no good use for the patient because there is a way to get Medicaid, and if you have too much money in New York, you can have a pool trust. If you have too many okay. assets in New York, you could have an irrevocable trust. And those things are just the remedies to get around if you have too much income or assets. So like I said yeah. before, everybody qualifies for Medicaid. You just have to see if it's worth it for you to do these things to make sure, you, make sure you're qualified. Yeah. And really, the pool trust is a, a huge favor that the government did for the average uh, New Yorker is because they can get Medicaid with all the wonderful benefits and keep all their money with the pooled income trust. You know, I want to talk about different states, and I know that you're extremely well-versed in New York, uh, but Medicaid is a state-funded and state-run program. So essentially, every state does it differently. As our listeners might know, states have the flexibility to design their own programs and coverage specifications. What does this mean? And also, why does it matter? So it means that the, each state can decide, well, listen, this is our budget and we want to mm-hmm. give the patients or the clients or the, or the Americans of their state uh, access to this program or they don't. So New okay. York State happens to be, especially in this area, really, really superior to all the other states because they have a remedy for each thing. Like I can tell you now that some states don't have a pool trust altogether. If you make too much money, you don't qualify, done. And if you make too much wow. money, you got to give it to the government. But over here wow. in New York, they let you make uh, over the 954 limit or 1367 for a husband and wife. And anything mm-hmm. above those limits, the excess income, the spend down or the surplus, that can go to a pooled income trust. Now, if a state you know doesn't have a big budget, like New York now has doesn't have a great budget, but they're just all into whatever the patients need and to get into sure. it. Unfortunately, now they're just now now they're trying to re. Uh, reassess that mistake that they made and now they're trying to make let's say, a two and a half year look back instead of a one month look back okay and they, they they didn't implement it yet but it's definitely something that they're looking to do so for the state of new york with them changing their look back period how is that going to affect people in new york that are looking for medicaid so if you had two hundred thousand dollars two years ago mm-hmm. and now okay. you're applying for medicaid the government will definitely ask you they're going to ask you for two and a half years of your bank records and all your financial statements. And then when they see that you had 200 grand last year, they're going to want a detailed <laughs> information about what happened to that money. I if see. you gifted it to somebody, they're going to penalize you for that gift. If you gave it to somebody, they're going to penalize you for that. If you show them you had $200,000 worth of bills that were for your daily living expenses or a ramp in the house or whatever it was, mm-hmm. then they'll let it go. But they will ask you to identify and prove uh, those things on, on the two and a half year look back. Right now, there's a one month look back. So if you emptied your account in you know January and you apply in right. February, you'll be good to go. Do you think there's going to be a lot less people that are going to be eligible for Medicaid? Correct. The, unfortunately, you- it'll it'll involve coming to the office, uh, mm-hmm. seeing your finances, setting up a irrevocable trust, and 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 then two years later applying for Medicaid. I see, and so. The reason that they're doing that, in your opinion, is it because they're trying to reduce the amount of money that they spend in their state budget? I do believe that. And I do believe that they realize that by these two remedies, they're allowing wealthy people to join Mm -hmm. Medicaid, which is not the reason for it. Uh, The purpose of Medicaid is for the disabled and elderly that don't have enough money for insurance. The insurance here is crazy at this point. Um, mm-hmm. And they don't want millionaires getting onto Medicaid. So right. a millionaire that's willing to go through 
whatever you need to go through, then they're really, you know, that's just cheating and stealing from the government. And sure. they're realizing this now, so they're trying to change the rules to a two and a half year look back. Just like by nursing home, there's a five year look back with Medicaid for the community, they're doing, they're trying to push for a two and a half year look back. So I think the message that people need to understand is that each state does it different. And whether it's a two-year look back, a one-month look back, I know California has no income limits. The state of Tennessee has a five-year look back period, and also they don't have any Medicaid expansion. Um, they have very strict strict uh, expectations for diagnoses and things like that for somebody to be eligible for Medicaid. But the ultimate outcome, in my opinion, uh, is that if you want to access Medicaid, you have to be considered low income, whether that means you've spent all of your money and you have none left because you spent it all on care uh, or you didn't have any money saved for retirement and you may have gotten sick and now you need long term care. But either way, you have to be low income to qualify for Medicaid. That, I couldn't agree with that statement more. And, and just to just to give you an idea of what the government expects out of New Yorkers, sure. uh, in assets, they allow a New Yorker, a single person, to have 16,000 in assets complete and 954 in income. And for a husband and wife, they expect you to have 26,000 total or 1367 in income. So they really want you to be poor uh, and, and low income to get onto these programs. They also realize that you know, somebody living on, it's almost impossible to live on 954 because your social security is 954 and you're just, right. you know, you're just barely surviving. So that's how right. they came up with the pool trust and the irrevocable trust for assets. But with that rule came the people that are sliding in that are really wealthy. So they're stuck in a, in a place where, you know, they want to help people out, but then there are people taking advantage of the situation. So let's talk about the enrollment process. When or how can you enroll? And on the surface level, what does the enrollment process look like and how long typically will it take? So you can enroll in Medicaid anytime you want. So okay. that's it. You can definitely enroll in it. And how to enroll is, unfortunately, the government made a very difficult long-term care community Medicaid application. Okay. And uh, most people that do it by themselves will get declined and not know why. Um, they want to have all your financial records. They want to know anything that's in your name and in your account that has been there for the last couple of months or whatever it is. They want all the details. Mm -hmm. um, the, the process is actually quite simple. We have a program that submits it electronically to Medicaid. The, the longest part of this process is the family members getting us the documents. Uh, I see. There's a, a, sh a short list of documents that they need, about uh, 10 or 12 documents in order to submit the application. And unfortunately, they miss one of them, and the government's quick to say no. All right, decline, decline, decline. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why people like us are here to help you and guide you through the sometimes overwhelming process of applying for Medicaid and getting home care and the pool trust. So when people get declined, that doesn't mean it's the end of the road, right? That's correct. It does not mean right. that. It means that you missed something, and if you go mm -hmm. to somebody that knows what they're doing, they'll be able to identify what you missed, help you figure out what the problem is, and then submit it to Medicaid again. You know, I'm curious, are there companies like yours in other states that you know of? So there are um, few okay. in between. And New York is a little bit more saturated. Uh, it seems mm -hmm. like there's a lot more people trying to get onto home care in the state of New York. Uh, there are right. other people. Uh, most other states have lawyers that do this. But I, I need to tell your audience one thing. You do not need mm -hmm. a lawyer to apply for Medicaid. Essentially, Medicaid is a free program that the government gives out, and you can fill it out in a regular application. The, the problem mm -hmm. is that they made it difficult to fill out. Uh, so lawyers are charging, you know, unknowing people like an obscene amount of money for no reason. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I would I would do a little shopping before you just settle with some person, or at least you know do do some due diligence to find out what you need, what needs to be done, because most people in New York that have a lawyer never needed one. You don't need a lawyer to apply for Medicaid. What happens to those people who don't have enough money to pay for care, but they make too much money or have saved too much money to qualify for Medicaid? 
So the simple answer, the uh, remedy for having too much money is called an irrevocable trust. Now, okay. it really depends when, when I speak to a client, how much money are we talking about? If you're going to tell me it's a couple hundred thousand or more or a house or two in Florida, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So then you need to have an irrevocable trust. And that's the most positive legal way to do it. In other words, you, you, you go to a lawyer. We have lawyers on staff. Um, you go to a lawyer, you set up an irrevocable trust and make sure it's irrevocable. I cannot tell your audience enough times. It has to be irrevocable. Okay. If a lawyer tells you that it should be revocable, then he doesn't know mm -hmm. what he's talking about. So it has Got to be it. an irrevocable trust. That's the, the easy, simple remedy for having too many assets. If somebody tells me they have $10,000 over the limit, I'll tell them, just withdraw ten grand and just keep it in cash and do what you got to do. But you don't need sure. to make an irrevocable trust for $10,000. And so once they do the irrevocable trust, they still have to wait two years, correct? Not at this point, but eventually. Okay. At this point, you can make an irrevocable trust and then apply for the next two weeks. Got it. Let's talk about Medicare one more time. Can you have Medicare and Medicaid at the same time? But also, can you have Medicare and private insurance at the same time? So... The answer to your first question is yes. You can have Medicare and Medicaid at the same time. Um, okay. So it, actually, it's the best thing. It's the best of both worlds. If you can have Medicare, will always be the patient's primary medic, uh, okay. medical insurance. Always. Um, okay. What happens is is that you need you need a supplemental plan, which some people buy, but Medicaid is your in-house supplemental plan. So okay. for long-term care, Medicaid will take over completely. But for short-term care, Medicare will still be. And Medicare will always be the primary. Now, in regards to your second part of the question, in regards mm -hmm. to private health insurance. So now, the policies that they're selling these days in New York, it doesn't really count for much. So you could have, you could have your own insurance and you could pay for it. But really, if you have... Uh, Medicaid, you can then let go of your your supplemental plan because Medicaid okay. w should and will cover the same things that your your supplemental plan covers. Um, one thing I want to mention is that if you have a long term care policy that they used mm -hmm. to sell in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s uh, that has a cash value to it, that mm -hmm. the government will ask you to spend the cash value first, and then you can get onto Medicaid. You can get approved for Medicaid, but they're going to ask you to please use that policy before. Uh, having Medicaid pay for the home needs. So with regards to Medicaid paying for long-term care, do, do the supplemental insurance policies, do they pay for long-term care as well? Not a long-term care policy, but just like supplemental insurance to Medicare, do they pay for long-term care? Absolutely not. The only okay. company, the only insurance that pays for long-term care in the state of New York is Medicaid or if you have a long-term care policy. Supplemental policies are really to cover your medicines, your co-pays at the doctor, or your short-term visits. In other okay. words, Medicare will pay 80% of almost everything, but the things that they don't mm -hmm. cover, the supplemental plan will cover. Or in this I case, see. Medicaid will cover. So Medicaid is the primary payer for institutional and community-based long-term services and supports. How can we better prepare to utilize this program, and what is your message to those preparing their finances and long-term care plan? So they definitely, if, if, there's a, if, if there's a significant amount of money, they should have a, a lawyer set up a irrevocable trust, and they should okay. use one of their children or somebody that they really trust uh, to be the beneficiaries and the trustees of those uh, trusts. Um, like I said before, keep your documents mm -hmm. uh, and check out what mom and dad, mom and dad have in savings and checkings, joint accounts. In other words, there is no reason for your mom and dad to have seven different bank accounts. If you can keep it down to one or two or three, it'll be very helpful for you too, so you can concentrate all their money and the extra money put into a trust or somebody else's name. The, the reason why they use a irrevocable trust is because essentially they don't want the patient to be able to dip into anywhere and get money. I if see. you want Medicaid, then they want you to, on paper, be worth $15,000 straight and that's yeah. it. Right. Um, but so, so gather mom and dad's information. Don't throw out mail that comes from Medicaid either. In other words, people tend to throw out the renewal forms and they get kicked off of Medicaid and they need to do a new application if they miss the deadline for 30 days. So keep mom and dad's documents around. Um, I would like to tell your audience, there is a something called a Social Security Award Letter. It's one of those okay. government letters that you can rip off the sides. 
those letters are extremely important for Medicaid as well. Uh, there's another form called an SSA 1099 that your parents will have to file every year that they get from the government. That's something that you should keep as well, or at least make sure that your accountant is keeping it in the file. You want right. to have as much of, of your evidence of your finances as possible. And unfortunately, I've gone to some homes and it's just a flying mess. And then you go to some homes that have it like, hey, I got everything right here in the folder. They open yeah. it up and everything's their in their own binder. So you need to <laughs> Medicare card, their Social Security card, their award letters. These things are all important and very essential to the Medicaid application. Before we wrap up, I, I'd like to hear your opinion on not what you think of just Medicaid in terms of its future, but also just long-term care in general, because it just seems so expensive and it seems so difficult to access. Um, I mean, like, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think it's going to become something like uh, car insurance where everybody has to buy a long-term care policy uh, at some point in their life? Or, I mean, what do you think? So my personal opinion in, in what I've seen over the last 13 years is as follows. If you're mm -hmm. super wealthy, then most of the time things won't change and you'll just stay super wealthy and not need this. But if you're like in the middle or low class, like there's a good chance that you're gonna need it. For instance, I had a person that whose wife died and they left $500,000 for the care of the husband. Okay. Within two years, they were calling me saying, oh my God, we're running out of money. In, in New York right now, private pay home care is almost $35 an hour. And if you give me Insane. $35 an hour times 24 times 7 times 4 times 12, you're talking yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. I think that, unfortunately, it's only going to get worse. We have more people living to longer ages now uh, across the world. Um, I think that in New York specifically, they, they do something, they realize their mistake five years later, then they try to change it. And I'm guessing that's like in most states, unless the ones that are really strict that, that you know, they're happy with where they're at. But we have so many people joining mm -hmm. long-term care here that every two, three years, they're changing rules and regulations and they're just trying to make it harder and more difficult. You know, when they see an MLTC is making too much money, they cut them out somehow. If they see a home care agency is making too much money, they cut them out somehow. And they try to cut corners. It's not great. Uh, I do think that all middle class and low and, lo and lower income um, people should really keep their documents together and apply for Medicaid as soon as you're eligible. There's no reason not to. You know, it's crazy when you think about it. You spend your entire life saving for retirement, and then you turn 75, and you may need some form of long-term care because of a stroke or a heart attack. And like you were saying, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year are gone in a yeah. blink of an eye. One and that's that generational wealth. Literally. My, my, one of my chief complaints is when people call up, it's like, I don't understand. I worked so hard my whole life, and now you're telling me I can't get help? The government's supposed to help us. Right. So in New York, they have these remedies to help you, but it's really, I, I feel them, and it's true. Like, you know, you're paying your taxes, and you're paying your taxes, and I was, well, you have $70 over the limit, you can't get Medicaid. And like, and if you want it, you got to jump through oh, God knows what kind of hoops. Sure. And I do feel bad for them, and it's, and it's not fair. And, and in my office specifically, we will look at somebody's income and really, you know, even almost help them do it for free, just to, you know, just because I feel like you're, you're 75 years old. You don't need this in your life right now. You really put right. in all your effort. You raised your children right. You paid your taxes, and now all of a sudden the government's trying to screw you the last minute. Yeah, uh, that's where yeah. I come in and try to really help them and, and guide them through the process. Yeah. So we always like to end the show with a call to action. What's your best advice for someone entering the long term care industry as a patient, a caregiver or industry professional? So as an industry professional, you should really learn the, the rules and regulations as soon as possible. Like, don't don't tell somebody that there's a five-year look back when there's no such thing. A five-year look mm -hmm. back only applies to nursing home Medicaid. Don't tell your patients that it's a five-year look back for community Medicaid. That's for the okay. professionals. For caretakers and family members, I can't stress enough to do this sooner than later. There is no reason for you to call my office in an emergency. You can call mm -hmm. my office and we can be calm, cool, and collected, get the documents, apply for Medicaid, and if it takes three months to get approved, that's fine too. When you call me in an emergency and we have to call Medicaid every two days because it's an emergency and we're trying to push them, we have to use our favors, it doesn't help anybody. Plus, it's, it is a stressful process because, you know, mom and dad are going through something and now you're the caretaker and, and you have to help them and you want everything to get done as soon as possible. But you have to remember our private, our no, uh, 
you know, we can't blame our partner here. Our partner is the sure. government, and they have right. their rules and regulations, and they can tell you, sorry, it's going to take another six months, and nothing you can do. And people will just call us crying, and, and I feel bad for them. But my call to action is, when your parents are aging towards 65, 68, get their stuff in order. Get their documents mm-hmm. in order. Call somebody like myself to see what you need to get done so you don't have to get to that point where you're calling us crying in an emergency. Uh, we would love to be able to help you in a easier, cool, calm, and collected fashion as opposed to you crying and yelling over the phone that you need this as soon as possible. And then when we tell you that you're a little bit over the limit, you just lose your mind. Um, yeah. it just, it's, just, it's, it's, it's very overwhelming, especially when in the background you know that mom is dying or mom has dementia and now all of a sudden you can't get your power of attorney in order. Like, If you called us when you were cool, calm, and collected, we would guide you that there's no hiccups. In other words, you would have a power of attorney, you would have a healthcare proxy. I would give you all this information free of charge just to help you get organized so when God forbid something happens or they're over 65, you can apply for long-term care community Medicaid. Bobby, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a breath of fresh air, uh, and I think more and more people uh, will start to utilize your services and other services like it. So we wish you a great day. Stay healthy uh, and keep doing the good work. Humble, grateful, and thankful. Thank you so much.